Hello everyone, welcome back to Portal from 1986, the self-build computer novel primarily written by Rob Swigert, and this is the Amiga version. So previously you may be aware that we have been streaming the game, uh, but that did prove to take quite a toll on my voice, so trying to do two hour long-ish streams um, of a game that is primarily a series, reading a series of texts was quite intensive maybe not the best way to handle it. Um, so I'm thinking from this point forward we're going to do it in a let's play format um, of episodes of about 30 minutes which should make it more digestible both to record and to watch I hope. Kind of uh, chapter sized nuggets is what I'm hoping for. I'm going to keep the visual format the same so on screen there's the, um, there's the game window itself there was a chat window which was more relevant when this was a stream. Um, nothing will be appearing there now, but um, I'm going to keep the general out the same so I can also have the notebook on screen. Um, I don't think it's going to be particularly relevant, but it is kind of nice to have the notes that I have taken thus far um, accessible and visible. Well, I'll say what I used to say um, when it was a live stream in that if anybody has any questions about the was previously gone on in the storyline. You are very welcome to drop me a comment. So as this will be a um, pre-recorded video, drop a comment on YouTube um, and I can get back to you um, with as much information as I'm able to. Um, the previous streams uh, up to this point are all available as, um, as VODs on the YouTube channel. So you can, you can catch up with them there as well if you're interested. Okay, let's get going. So. A uh, brief recap um, for anybody joining us at this point. We are an astronaut um, who, due to um, a failed mission and some kind of uh, cryo suspension, um, has returned to Earth in sort of hundreds of years in the future to find the human population has disappeared, but their structures are still around, um, although abandoned. And with the help of um, seemingly the last remaining uh, functional AI on the planet that we have access to anyway, Homer, um, are trying to reconstruct events piecemeal. So databases come back online, entries are unlocked um, bit by bit, and in between Homer is stitching them together into a narrative because Homer is primarily a storytelling AI. Um, so there is a distinct element of unreliable narrator about this narration. Um, so we are currently trying to track the uh, life events of Peter DeVore, who is apparently responsible for a um, a big event. Um, this is my note somewhere, isn't it? Let me just refresh myself because it's been a little while. Um, it was the migration. Yeah, so something that has been referred to. So Peter DeVore created the portal. Uh, for which this story is named, and then something called the Migration happened. Um, and it has been mentioned several times, but only in, in veiled senses. What we're trying to do is uh, reconstruct events. I think when we left it, we had just been to Homer, um, because Homer, as you can see here, has given us lots to think about. Um, and what Yes, there's nothing new there, so let's go back. Okay, so I'll do my, my usual uh, run through, so um, top left to right, and then row by row um, as we go through the database, see if there's anything new that's unlocked since last time. We left Peter DeVore uh, in a ship, which I believe is under the ocean? I think it was a, a submarine of some kind, um, hiding from his pursuer, who's probably his biological father, um, in a tank of frozen methane, I believe. It sounds a bit outlandish now I say it out loud, but um, let's see if Homer can break us into this database. Um, I believe that's what was happening. Okay, nothing in either of these categories to look at. SciTech.
Okay, Tank of Transport Schematic 3, presumably going to show us some methane tanks. Uh, General Science Technology Information Coronary Tanker Transport Schematic Agni Recreation and Refectory Centres Passenger and Crew Quarters Let's have a look. Oh yeah, I remember. I remember how these, these windows function. Um, okay, I think for our purposes that's kind of a... I mean, I like it. It's it's a suggestive, a suggestive graphic, um, but it's not really kind of a functional schematic for our purposes, is it? But, you know, that might be enough to, uh, to unlock the next part of the story, because that seems to be how this, uh, how this works. You have to... the story is throttled so that you can... you are forced to look at the supplementary materials, um, which are not always as interesting as they could be, I, I might venture. I will... Persist in making my way through um, all the categories, but sometimes you get a batch of stuff unlocked at the same time, um, and that can not exactly cascade, but can uh, promote uh, several different uh, advances to the uh, to the story. I believe we're up to date with all our characters. Again, it has been a little while since I since I played, um, so I won't bother going back to the character categories. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm feeling like it might just have been that tanker schematic that we needed to look at. Ultimately. Okay, Homer. My guess is you're going to have something for us. Yes, indeed. Okay. Well, let's see what shakes out next. In response to his spoken command, the door dilated to reveal the crawl space. Light suffused the tunnel. Oh, I remember. I've got a Homer voice that I read this in. Peter and the others stepped into their protective gear, a skin-tight osmotic membrane fabric programmed to retain a designated percentage of body heat, allowing the rest to dissipate. Their faces were covered by standard undersea breathing masks with solid oxygen cheek pads. When Peter spoke, his voice was muffled, since no energy transmission devices were allowed. Follow me, he said gliding into the passage on his hands and knees. Never seen anybody glide on their hands and knees before. As soon as they were all inside, the access hatch closed, and they could all feel the delicate tug of vacuum at their skin surface as the fields flushed air. At the same time, the cold increased. Ten metres in another access door dilated, and Peter led them into a deep, shallow space lit an eerie flickering white, its walls and low ceiling coated with frost. The hatch, ordinarily used to pump the gas in and out of the cargo cell, was close to the ceiling, a titanium alloy glowing that same dead white. They couldn't tell how deep the room was since the floor was coated thick with a strange ice and snow. There was barely room to stand, Peter's footprints left black slush and twisted wraiths of vapour which rose and danced and fell as frosty snow again as he crossed the frozen methane. They've lowered the temperature, Peter said, picking his way through the methane mist across the slippery surface. The methane is frozen just long enough for us to get through. Breathe as slowly as you can. We must move as deliberately and quickly as possible. These suits can't cope with this kind of temperature for long. Not for us. Breathe slowly, but stay close. Behind him, the group sloshed close together. 
Behind him, the group sloshed close together, heads bent low. Larin, coming last, looked back and saw their tracks filling with black liquid. Already the mist was obscuring them, the slush turning liquid under her feet despite the insulation. Look at the temperature rise behind us enough to allow the methane ice to melt back to liquid as soon as we're out. By now the ENC will be aboard and looking for us, so we must keep moving. This room was 20 metres deep. Soon the dancing crystals closed in as the methane snow turned to slush. They kept going. Finally they reached the dump port. He spoke his name, the port dilated, and they were in an access tunnel again. As the door closed behind them, they could feel a strange groaning through the floor as the methane ice broke up and melted. We're now cut off, Peter said. There's no retreat, and we don't know how long we'll be here. Is our hidey hole going to be as cold as that room? Shem asked. We couldn't survive long in that, Peter shook his head. It'll be cold, but there'll, there won't be methane in it. It'll be dry, but not warm. It'll have air shielded to look like more liquid methane. Now come on. That wasn't what I thought was happening. They continued further and further aft, and down another level. Each level, each rank of cargo cells back, the rooms grew smaller. The fluid dynamics of liquid methane required smaller cells toward the centre, but it made the going increasingly difficult since they had to crawl in and out of smaller and smaller rooms. It took half an hour to reach their prison. Peter felt the fear when he heard that awful groan as methane ice turned to liquid in the final chamber behind them, closing their escape. Okay. Again, more um, novelistic detail. That doesn't really add to adds to the detail, but doesn't really add to the narrative. Because I was happy that um, we'd established how Peter and friends were going to evade capture. Uh, so now we've got to go and do the uh, rounds again. Here we go, methane transport schematic. Basically, I want Peter Devore to get out of this tank of methane and uh, have the story to progress. That would be lovely. Thank you. So this is another schematic of the cargo holds where, um, so they've kind of gone behind a, a block of methane um, and they're just sort of tucked in a little cubby hole the other side by the sounds of it. Whereas I thought they were going to be in special uh, temperature control suits and then frozen inside the methane. Um, but that, that was my interpretation of what I'd read. But yeah, it doesn't really matter. It, it, is, a, it is a small incidental detail, really. Um, because what Peter wants to do is get to Antarctica and its independent community and get on with his plan to liberate everybody from their, their mortal concerns. Okay. Let's just check in on people in case anybody's popped up, um, as characters tend to pop up in advance of their appearance in the narrative. Uh, 
Okay, we got something in central process as well. Life support via central processing seven. Uh, image of okay somebody stats upload life support via central processing ref number one two three seven six eight monitor sampling agni submersible tanker ship log zero four two three two zero seven five the following humans show gradual decreasing life support function Devor P Steel S Hughes T Alaman M Hara W Herd B Epstein T, Martinez L, Fong W, Jones S, Chan S, Hicks R, Alan P, Alea, Ayala T, Chin T, William C, Akashi J, Abram W. Chiplog reported level 5 life support alarm. Chiplog notes no action. Life support functions decreased to 0.7% nominal. Central processing AI Geneva noted. End upload. Is this the twist? Peter Devore never made it to Antarctica, and something else happened entirely. That could be the twist. Um, so I don't know why they're... So I think, I thought they'd been like disconnected from the... Uh, all the bits that would track their, uh, their presence on the ship, so I don't know why we've got some data about their, their life their life signs, really. Okay, Homer, give me a chunk of narrative, please. Just a, sort of a medium length is good for me. Thanks. The close walls glowed white and featureless. Even the corners were rounded, and the light was so even it was disorienting. Peter arranged everyone into a circle, cross-legged and facing inward. Then he spoke, and the lights went out. He talked to them in the darkness, softly. We give off no electromagnetic radiation, even light. We must keep our masks on despite the air, which is pure nitrogen. There are no toilet facilities and nothing to eat. We're going to remain in place with minimal motion for an indefinite time. How long is indefinite? One of the women asked. No more than five days, Peter said. Oh, Peter. Um, five days? We'll die, we'll suffocate. We can't live five days in here. Oh, sorry, I clicked a little too soon there. I'm going to be carried away with the uh, the drama of it all. Hopefully we won't have to, but we can, and if necessary, we will, Peter replied. I'm afraid, someone said, a muffled voice without identity. So am I, Peter said, but we will face stranger things than this. How will we know when we can leave? How will we know when we can leave? Peter recognised Rover's voice. That you will come to get us, Peter said. Meantime, we are going to learn patience. Well, it's a bit late to learn patience then when you're trapped in nitrogen for five days. I'm presuming it's not liquid nitrogen. Oh, Homer, you're... How, how come you're... We've just been there. Why are you rotating again? Is there more? Okay, you're going to give this to me without making me work for it. I appreciate that. Our probes have returned from Antarctica. The winds still blow fiercely off the plateau down the glaciers. Snow and ice cover the land and much of the surrounding sea. It is day down there now. The sun hangs above the horizon and circles slowly around the pole around and around and around, moving higher into the sky toward the polar noon, then settling slowly once more toward the horizon. Yet the wind still howl, the ice groans and creaks and roars, sounds like the collapse of civilizations rumble and crack across the endless plains. We could call it desolation, as it was before man came. Yet his works are everywhere. The tunnels and chambers along the coastal marge Beneath the sea, where the great tank is docked and the cities beneath the ice, all are still there. The caldera of Mount Erebus still fumes, 
and within its volcanic rock are the ruined corridors of Psyche, empty and sad. <coughs> Symbolism. The winds blow through, snow accumulates in the corners, in the living quarters and the hallways, the meeting rooms and refectories. Ice has covered the wall hangings and sculptures. Ice and cold have stilled the music, replaced it with the winds. Sea ice and glacier ice and pressure ice have closed around everything with an ever-tightening grip. Our probe moves slowly through the corridors, listening to the sounds of ice and wind and nothing else. Its molecular sensors gathered impressions and stored them. Impressions of cold and emptiness and of fugitive ghosts. Did I say that? Ghosts. Yes, we have so much memory. Imagine the Leyden jars. Organic crystals, really, but the name had some historic meaning once. Storing capacitor after capacitor of impressions up and down the spectra. Imagine the tight three-dimensional structures in the databanks, folded into holographic configurations of everything that was thought or said or done. Every formula, every poem, every biomonitor assessment of feeling or sensation for all the humans. Imagine the senses drifting through those empty halls, gathering layer after layer of experience back to the beginnings of the world net. The molecules are in deprogram processing. The ghosts spring out, intangible but endlessly repeating their dance, lifting their hands to gesture, moving their mouths to speak, turning and bending and making music. These are the ghosts that fill those halls. Years of them. We might as well be there, have been there, to see it all again. So complete are the recordings. Now overlay this impression of life and movement and purpose with the awful desolation that is Antarctica now. That is the Psyche Warren. So much information floods in now. From SciTech, from history, from geography, even from central processing. Okay, um, so big, big software update. Is that what you're telling me? Fab. Okay, let's do the rounds. We'll do the rounds uh, one more time, and that's probably a vi be a video, I reckon. Okay, so nothing new in Med 10. Not in Silic. SciTech. Without the Okay, laden jar technology and data probe specifications. So we're finding out some more uh, Homer backstory, I think. What's our image going to be, do you reckon? Well, I think we. Okay, that's a laden jar full of crystals, apparently. General science and technology information. Current entry laden jar technology. A fanciful name for a routine form of holographic data crystal. The Leyden jar was developed as an automatic data transfer and storage medium. Based on picoelectronic organics, Leyden jars are self-replicating and can grow to considerable size, up to 25 cm base diameter, depending on the quantity and, to a lesser extent, the quality of the data forming its matrix. Data compaction can include complete holographic scene reproduction, personal monitors and major database node correlations, full sensorium scan data, life support, memo and telecom summaries. Laden jars are used primarily for archiving purposes. Okay, is that not... Um, I, think I think that's the same technology that Edmod and Homer are made from, I believe. So this is data probe specifications. We've got... that is presumably an image of a data probe. Yellow on grey. Bold choice. Data processifications. 
Central processing may, when deemed necessary by a consensus of major prioritising nodes, appropriate manufacturing facilities to prepare and deploy information-seeking probes. That's what we've been doing. Such probes may be air, land or waterborne, and may use any appropriate technology provided such appropriations do not conflict with basic budget requirements or prescribed technologies. Standard probe design follows. Okay, does it? Or was that the attachment? Was that the, uh, the old email attachment there? I think it was. Fab. Uh, so that was SciTech. Let's see what's in history, because we were promised history. Um, we might even get like a decade update, which uh, um, are usually quite a journey when we get them. Oh, here we go. Psyche, Erebus Installation. Let's read about it. Psyche, Erebus Installation, uh, parentheses, Double A Erebus Node Summary Report, ref at AD 2070. Seven levels, 12,000 employees, including researchers and support personnel. Council Intelligence concludes Cyan Equation and related projects were expanding by the summer of 2070 under the direction of GAD, Dipmore Seminole, aka Mentor. GAD, parentheses Nobel Prize 2002, had established a silent database in 2002. Cyan Equations, parentheses, first formulation, in 1990. After years of work at the Psyche installation in Baja, the facility moved to Antarctica where surveillance was difficult. Psyche Erebus had access to all of Ant Pico Electronic Technology and Filament Farms. Intercorp Council feared internal feared oh hang on. Intercorp Council feared parentheses internal technical intelligence memorandum number one three eight nine four three two stroke double A that a dangerous technology would eventually emerge and undertook steps to prevent this from happening. Uh, yes, as, as I understand, that's the backstory of what's happening. Uh, we're just getting a data crystal failure image there from Homer, which I guess might, um, if we were to log them all up, that might be a little narrative layer. Um, if those are things that maybe um, Homer is doing more synthesis with. All right, let's read about Terminus. Terminus, parentheses, Sorrel, Jules, summary. Terminus was cited in 2012 by Jules Sorrel during the third Transantarctic Safari. He kept detailed notes and some old-fashioned still hollow records, now so fragmented that most resolution has been lost. Mean temperature, according to Sorrel, is 15 degrees Celsius, parentheses, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat source unknown, but presumed to be geothermal. Terminus has never been detected from satellite or airship overflights. This precise location is unknown. Reasons unclear, but speculate the terminus is shaded by ice, ice overhang or significant rock outcroppings. Sorrel claims he planted some modified beech and conifers, ferns, even grasses. This claim cannot be substantiated. Terminus would have to be located within this region, since the route of the third transantarctic safari was inaccurately documented, since it was done on foot and without modern tracking satellites. Antarctic government has mounted seven expeditions in the past 65 years to look for Terminus. All were success unsuccessful, much of the continent remains unexplored. Here are the re records of the seven expeditions. Where are the records of the seven expeditions? Uh... Are they going to appear now? Oh. Okay, well here's uh, the history of 2070 to 2079. Um, so get your pens at the ready. Twenty seventy. Twenty seventy to 71. Peter makes critical connection. Peter meets Jimmy Radix. Regent Sable arrives at Springfield West. Simi Devore's premiere of Dreamleaf. So this is overlapping more directly with things that we've uh, encountered elsewhere in the story. 2072 to 73. Regent Sable orders full monitor of Peter Devore's EdComp stats. Effects of MP weapons uh, of MP weapon appear in Peter. Peter develops tentative hypothesis of portal. 2074 to 75. 
Peter first contacts Wanda Six Love. The Mind Wars begin, last until 2091. Simi Devore dies of genetic abulia disorder, September 13th, 2075. Thatcher leaves Antarctica for Springfield, April 2075. Regent Sable arrives Springfield West again. Peter Devore and the others disappear. Jimmy Radix dies. 2076-77. Anti-ant hysteria... That's an uh, exciting expression, anti-ant. Anti-ant hysteria grows in Europe and Asia. The anomaly is discovered. 2077. ISAT graviton detector. And what about it? World polarised. Mind wars continue unabated. 2078-79. Mentor dies. Mount Erebus. Anti-ant hysteria results in abortive AEF invasion. The Stalingrad effect. Underwater destruction of Ross Ice Tongue destroys invasion. Peter vanishes into high plateau, finds terminus. Well, how would you know that? So we're heading to terminus. I don't want. I just don't want the, all the details backfilled. I just want to keep motoring on, really. So this sort of um, slightly warmer. Um, with vegetation oasis in Antarctica is kind of where we're heading, narratively. Um, I don't know if there's going to be anywhere for my ast astronaut to go there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we get to find out what happens to the astronaut at the end of this. Okay. Okay, we've got more characters. We've got Jules Sorrell and James Rakin. Oh heck no. We've got <laughs> we've got Jules Sorrell, who seemed to be some kind of explorer. Um, and then remember that list of people that we read about who were probably in the uh in the tank with um <laughs> <laughs> in the tank with um with Peter, they've all got entries. Yikes. Let's see if we can get away with not reading that today. Maybe we'll do that next episode. So that can be a big old uh, a big old thing we do. Next episode, I think. Okay, McMurdo Mount Erebus. We can have a look at here. All homes flashing. So this was a crucial thing we needed to look at. There you go. Psyche, Mount Erebus. McMurdo C. Oh, circa? 2075. Geog Ref 2075, stroke double A, stroke alpha. McMurdo. Mount Erebus lazed tunnels at 2,790 metres above sea level, southwest slope. This is the final location of the Psyche facility in Antarctica. Geographic AI extrapolation, stroke 2106. Fair enough. Um, come to Homer. I have a file ready for you. Okay, never creepy when you say that, Homer. Never creepy, just remember. Um, great, okay. So that was Georg, I think. I'm going to miss out the uh, personal things because we can. We hopefully save that for later. We'll just uh, get a chunk more Homer if we can. Okay, probe dispatch ref uh, 14869 stroke A. Let's see what this is all about. Where's this probe going? Is this a, a present probe? A past probe? Oh, look at this text. McMurdo Erebus 7, Ross I 2, Vostok 1, Shoah 1. Res 50, probe dispatch, PR stroke 74238988-3. Probe dispatch, initial routing, McMurdo stroke Erebus 7 automatics, Ross I 2 automatics, Vostok 1 automatic, Shoah 1 automatic, reserved 50 probes for future use pending AI consensus approval, 
See SciTech for specifications. So that kind of relates to the backstory on whether probes are authorised or not, which again, well detailed but not necessarily something I need. Not necessarily dramatically interesting, I would say. Um, let's just dip back into SciTech before we go to Homer, in case there's something here that is uh, that is relevant. Um, what have we got? No, no, uh, we're up to date there. All right, let's go see Homer to round out this episode, this chapter of our story. Some of the foreigns are as yet unexplored, even by our high-speed probes, yet it is certain that no one remains. What we find most curious about the place is the absence of mood tailoring and other mental-emotional support organics. Even the longevity equipment was removed, apparently after Mentor's death. The place looks most like an old-fashioned monastery, small cells containing a narrow padded bunk, waste facilities, Compartments for cold weather clothing and data capsules lined the corridors. Wall hangings were made by hand, from feathers, fur, and woven fabrics made from grown materials. Some stone had been worked by hand as well, carved into fantastical shapes. Heads with yawning mouths filled with teeth, enormous headdresses made of feathers and horn, beasts and demons out of reports of nightmare. From this we could deduce that the psyche workers were severely deprived of material facilities, and so crippled mentally and emotionally as well. This might explain why they worked with such apparent fervour on the project, and later why they followed Peter through the portal. Everywhere is Peter's shadow, his ghost moving through these halls, these empty and meaningless spaces, stored in Central Processing's archives. Okay, and then this little bit, is that, yeah, so it's just this one, isn't it? This one then. Certainly Regent Sable's probes found nothing aboard the Agni. Oh good, we're going back to that part of the story. Only the deep cold that clawed at the bone, that froze the heart in place. He could touch the walls of the tanker pods and feel it crouched in there, waiting to seize his throat, to stop his voice, to slow and still his life. He felt, in the end, that no one could live in there, and he had searched the rest of the vessel so thoroughly he knew that Peter and his group were not aboard. Yet when he left, he was uneasy. He felt that he was missing something vital. Yeah, you numpty. What is it you fear? Aleph asked him when he returned to Geneva empty-handed. What precisely do you fear? Her insistence irritated him, and he moved out onto the balcony overlooking the lake. The first winds of a sullen storm stirred his hair. He watched the clouds move over the waters, turning them dark and impenetrable. At last he turned. What do I fear? A good question, my dear Aleph. I do wish I knew an answer. Do you know the aphorisms of Mentor? No? Well, he has said, to knit, one must first shear. What can that mean, Regent? Oh, he threw the words away with a gesture. It's an old-fashioned idea, having to do with sheep. Sheep, you see, are plastic animals and rather stupid. Shearing is taking off their coats, thereby, you see, making them quite naked. Are we the sheep, Aleph, to be stripped? Mentor has met Peter face to face by now, I feel sure. And that is something I fear greatly. Oh, okay, end of segment. That's not a place to leave it. Yeah, okay. Well, and at that odd place, we'll leave it for today. Let's do a quick save while I remember. And I'll say thank you very much for joining me. Um, we'll be back again soon with another chunk of narrative and 
probably quite a lot of it will be devoted to looking at um, a long list of characters, charts of vital statistics, at least at probably their last known living uh, state. Uh, so that will be, um, be something anyway. Um, but hopefully that will unlock some sort of progress because we're, we're still crawling along, unfortunately. But data crystal storage is now complete. So lovely. See you next time. Take care. Bye.